Today, we continue with our study in the names of God. We're in Genesis chapter 17. So if you'll stand with me, please. I'd like to read the first eight verses of Genesis chapter 17. When Abraham, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceeding, exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I will give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Shall we pray? Lord, such a beautiful promise, a beautiful passage, and a beautiful name that we're able to discover this morning. And I pray that you'll help us to have ears to hear, that our minds would be attuned to what it is that you wish to speak with us today, and how it applies to the Christian life in our day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, I typically grab hold of a devotional book and read through it through each year. And each year I try and find a new one or a different one, one that would be um, a blessing to me. It's very often that I'll start one and then toss it to the side uh, and go to the next one only because it, it doesn't, you know, sometimes they speak to you and sometimes they don't. Well, I've been using one that's speaking to me quite nicely these days, and it's uh, one a devotional book by Billy Graham. And uh, it, this uh, last week, February 13th, he wrote this. He said, you probably have seen the bumper sticker which says, God is my co-pilot. It sounds nice, he said, and very spiritual until you think about it. God doesn't want to share the controls over your lives. He wants us to relinquish them and let him have control of our lives. That is um, really the issue, really the struggle that we face in the Christian experience. And that is who's wrestling to run our lives? Who is controlling our lives? What is controlling our lives? What thoughts are controlling our lives? Who's the boss of our lives? Of course, these are many questions that are at the heart of what we're going to consider this morning. Today we discover another name of God, the name El Shaddai. El Shaddai. We briefly touched on this name last week when we were in Exodus chapter 6 and in verse 3. There in Exodus chapter 6 verse 3, God said, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty. But I did not reveal my name, Yahweh, to them. Yahweh. Of course, Yahweh means the becoming one, and El Shaddai means the Almighty One. But what does El Shaddai mean to us today? How are we to understand it? God himself calls himself El Shaddai, or God Almighty. It is actually found in the Old Testament only eight times in that form as God Almighty. But the name Shaddai is one that uh, stands alone as Almighty, and we see that quite often in Scripture, 31 times actually in the book of Job, nine times in other parts of the Old Testament. It has a Greek equivalent, typically translated as Almighty in English. It's used ten times in the New Testament and always in reference to our God. In all this term, Almighty is uh, used around 60 times in the Bible and only in reference to to God. Now, while the name uh, does mean Almighty God, it has a deeper meaning uh, than what our English translations allows us to understand or reveals to us. For instance, the word or the name El. El is a Hebrew word for God. Uh, it also means power and might. It's used in that way quite often. 
Uh, Laban, for instance, said to his son-in-law Jacob, it is in my power to do you harm, Genesis chapter 31. And that word power in Hebrew is El. It is in my El, or my power, to do you harm. Now, people often speak about their higher power, but there really is no higher power except our God, El Shaddai. And so power is already contained within his name, at least as far as we understand these words, El Shaddai. Yet the translators of our English Bibles seem to want to double that power by calling him, in a sense, in the English, Powerful Almighty. That's sort of what the name would trans- translate if we were to translate it in that way. It works. Sure, it works. But was it necessary to translate it that way in English? And do know that it is a translation. It's not the original. It's translated. Uh, is, is that really what God wanted to reveal to us? And is that really how he wanted us to know him, simply as the power? The power, well, yes, he is the power for sure. But Shaddai is translated almighty in English, but the Hebrew root of the word Shaddai means something completely different. It comes from the root word Shad, S-H-A-D, and is translated breast, 24 times in the scripture. The breast, as in a woman's breast. And uh, the meaning has to do with, with nourishment or sustenance or supply, but mostly in the idea of sufficiency. So when you connect the word L or all power, it means one who is powerful and sufficient to supply and satisfy all that you need. I may put it another way. It means our God is enough. God is enough. Or our God is all you need and all you will ever need. Now, our text actually provides us with all that we will ever need in coming to understand this beautiful name of El Shaddai. Uh, You'll remember a couple of weeks ago I mentioned this rule of interpretation known as the rule of first mention. Well, here we have the first mention of the name El Shaddai here in verse 1 of our text, chapter 17. Uh, Verse 1 provides us with a lot of detail. In fact, it gives us most of the details that we're going to need in order to form a proper definition of the name El Shaddai. And so as we read this first verse, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord, Yahweh, appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, Almighty God. Shaddai El would be, if we were to translate from English back to Hebrew, but it's really Hebrew, and it comes across, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be blameless. I love these Old Testament stories. As we've been using them to understand certain teachings about our God. Now, Paul the Apostle apparently loved them too. In fact, he writes this in Romans chapter 15. For whatever was written in former days, meaning Old Testament days, was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So the Scriptures are written to increase our faith, to give us hope, to teach us lessons of faith through these things. And these Old Testament stories, definitely divinely inspired, recorded in Scripture for us so that we could learn faith lessons from them. But it's important to know the details of the stories or the important lessons may be lost. So uh, they're written not only with history in mind, but with a spiritual purpose and with a practical value and a practical application. So let's look at these details. First of all, we see that Abram was 99 years old when Yahweh appeared to him. Why is that important for us to know? Well, God tells us these little details with a purpose. He, he's not frivolous. He's not pointless in the things that he has recorded for us. Here he recorded the timeline of Abram's life in order for us to actually take note of it. Now the previous chapter, chapter 16, gives us even more details. In the very last verse of chapter 16, it says, Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So we learn from this that between chapter 16 and 17, there is a 13-year span. Abram's son, Ishmael, was actually 13 years old. Ishmael. Who's Ishmael? 
And where did he come from? Well, that takes us back to chapter 15 of the book of Genesis. And back in Genesis 15, God spoke to Abram and said, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. God's promise. You're going to be a blessed person, Abram. I'm going to bless you. Well, Abram, happy and politely said, Thanks, God. But Sarai and I would like to have kids. We need an heir. We need an heir. They've been trying, of course, to have children, uh, but were unsuccessful. Then God, in verse 5 of Genesis 15, God brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be, And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So God gives Abram a promise of multitudes of children or descendants and ancestors. Abram, of course, believed the Lord here, and he worships God in a sense. We're going to find that that's exactly how it translates. But time was running out for this aging couple. And before they knew it, Sarai had long passed the age of being physically able to have kids. And so Abram, a very rich man, needed an heir, an heir who would be able to inherit all of his wealth. Yes, of course, he believed the promise of God. But by now, it seemed pretty hopeless. It was impossible. And Sarai was beginning to express her hopelessness, and she had lost hope completely. And as we come now into chapter 16, we see her frustration and Abram's frustration as well and how they began to conspire together in order to help God in fulfilling his great promise to them. In verse 1 of chapter 16, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children, Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children through her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. Now, you'll notice that there was no complaint or protest from Abram whatsoever. He simply said, yeah, I could do that for you, dear. And so he went home with Hagar, just as was suggested. Bad move. Very bad move. There are times when you listen to your wife, and there are times when you'd better not listen to your wife. Honey, does this shirt make me look fat? No, you don't have With everything we, we learn from this story, I'm notice I'm not, I'm just, I'm, I'm moving. <laughs> With everything, of course, that we learn from this story, here we find an act of de- des- desperation, uh, what should be called an act of their flesh. This wasn't faith at this point at all, but Abram sinned. Here, this, this man of faith was not acting in faith. Yes, the Lord allows this. It's important that we see this, that that God allows these sort of things to happen if we want them to. But we know that it was sin because of the fruit that came from it. In the very next verse of of this chapter 16, in verse 4, he went into Hagar, and she conceived. Hagar did. And when she saw that she had conceived, Uh, Her mistress, Sarai, became despised in her eyes. Suddenly, Hagar thought that she was better than her mistress. And Hagar began to disrespect Sarai. And Sarai, no doubt, was jealous and feeling very badly about this. And she began to mistreat her her servant girl, Hagar. Not only that, and here, guys, is the lesson to be learned. She blamed her husband and took it all out on him even though it was her idea. Notice in verse 5, Then Sarai said to Abram, 
my wrong be upon you. <laughs> How does that happen? Well, sure, it was my fault, but you're to blame. You should have shot me then or something. I don't know what the, she was thinking, but my wrong be upon you. I gave you my maid, but you didn't have to take her. I gave you my maid. It, it was a test. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Would he really take her? You, I can't believe you took her. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me, you creep. <laughs> so Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. When Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. So Sarai wasn't very nice. Oh, what a mess this was. But this is what happens when we take the steering wheel and start driving. This is what happens. This is the fruit of the flesh. And I'm sure that Abram thought he was helping God by doing this. Yeah, well, you know, how else can it happen? I mean, God is talking about things that, you know, God helps those that help themselves. What that means is, let me drive for a while. Let me take control of my life and see what I can do. Obviously, God has taken a nap and he's unable to do this job. And so Abram took it in upon himself to do it his way, or the two of them did it their way. And when we do that, we should always expect a disaster if we're in control of our own lives. As we enter chapter 17, and with this particular backdrop, Yahweh appears to Abram and says, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be blameless. Please allow me a moment, a li the liberty to interpret the Lord's meaning here. As if he was saying, Abram, I am all sufficient. I am enough here. I'm all you need. I'm all you're ever going to need. I've promised you, and I will keep my promise. Why did you do it your way? You're not Frank Sinatra. Some of you young guys are going, huh? Who? Who? I thought his name was Ippolito. But really, that's how we must see the Lord's intent here and why he uses this name El Shaddai, All-Sufficient One. According to this particular truth, Yahweh is asking Abram to live this way. This is how I want you to live. I want you to relate to me as El Shaddai. And as such, there are two things I want you to do. One, I want you to walk before me. And two, I want you to be blameless. Walking before me speaks to the outer life or one's behavior, one's conduct. While to be blameless involves the inner life or one's conviction, what one believes really. To walk before me means that God expects us to live with and to walk in this constant awareness of his presence as we walk, as we live in the knowledge of this awareness, realizing that he is watching us every detail of our lives, and he does so with great care, and he does so all the time. Walk before me. I see you. I see you. I'm watching you. Know that I'm watching you. Walk before me. And in light of this, God tells Abram, I've seen what you've been doing, and from now on, I expect better from you. From now on, walk before me. I'm El Shaddai. To be blameless involves the inner life, or if I may, the, the attitudes of the heart. Those are the things which govern the outer life, because the outer life is typically influenced by the inner life, meaning what, that we behave as we believe. We behave as we believe. And when these two sides of us, the outer and the inner lives, when these two sides of us are in conflict, then we call it hypocrisy. We call it insincerity or pretending. We claim to believe one thing, but we behave a whole different way. Something's wrong. And God calls Abram on this, saying in a sense, listen, I thought we had an agreement. I promised that I would bless you. I promised that I was going to make you a great nation, giving you descendants so numerous as the stars of the sky, as the sand of the sea. 
I promised you this. And you said you believed me, remember. What happened? I am El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. I am all you need. And you were okay with that. Now what's gone on? And if we believe this sort of thing, if we believe this truth, if we let God drive and walk by faith, then we will be blessed. That's the idea. And the application is that obvious here. That we are asked to walk in the truth of God's promise. We're asked to walk in His Word. In this conviction, this sincere belief, this sincere conviction. I really believe these things. And if I really believe these things, we behave as we believe. If we claim to believe in Him, if we claim to belong to Him, then we'll prove it in the way that we behave. I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. He is all we need. If we really mean it, if we really believe it, if we genuinely believe it, genuinely believe it, then we will be satisfied with Him and with Him alone. Isn't that really the message of Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, or I shall be satisfied, or I shall have no need. I will lack nothing. Isn't that the message of Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. And if He is my shepherd, I should be satisfied with that. Now, practically speaking, we actually do need more. Practically speaking, we need more, and so did Abram. And God was aware of that. And so Yahweh tells him more. Yahweh promises him more. And he said in verse 2 of chapter 17, I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. In verse 4, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I'm giving you more, Abram. I told you you'd be blessed. Well, I'm going to bless your socks off beyond what you can even imagine. You're going to have a lot of children, Abram. So many children, more than you'll be able to count. You won't be able to keep track of them all. In fact, they're going to form nations. Nations. You're not giving birth to children. You're giving birth to nationalities, my friend. That is a blessing. But God needed to do something to Abram first. He needed to change his name. Abram means father or exalted father or father who has been elevated, a high father, if you will. Abram, father. Well, it's sort of a funny name for a guy without any children. That was his name. He's identified as father but was fatherless except for Ishmael. Ishmael was an illegitimate child. They cheated, remember? This was not God's plan at all, but God allowed it. Now they've got this problem, this problem of a kid called Ishmael. He was a good kid, but he grew up to hate Israel. He became a nuisance to the people of God. But Ishmael came about as an act of human desperation, uh, an act of unbelief, not an act of faith. So God wanted to give Abram a new chance. From now on, I'm going to call you Abraham, which means a father of a multitude or a father of many, many nations. I'm going to call you Abraham. Now, he added to his name what in Hebrew amounts to only one letter, the letter H, or Ha, the letter Ha in Hebrew. It's the only letter that requires the exhaling of one's breath in order to say it, which to me is fascinating, because breath is a symbol or the image of life. Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. How cool is that? He added the ha, ha, breath. Jesus, in John chapter 20, he said, receive the Holy Spirit, and he breathed on them. (sighs) Breath. If you're not breathing, you're not living. A side note, in that this Hebrew 
word for breath is the same word for spirit. It's the word ruach. There's another word just like it, neshama. Both mean both breath and spirit. And the same is true with the Greek word pneuma. It's the same thing. It means both breath and spirit. The point here is that God added one element which was necessary for Abraham to bring life. And that was the breath of God. The miracle of his spirit. The breath of life. And if you don't have this breath of God, the spirit of God, then you're not alive yet. Physically you may be alive, but spiritually you are not. That's the difference between Abram and Abraham. It's the difference. Same thing in his spiritual life. Paul the Apostle said that you, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Jesus said you must be born again, born from above. Something spiritual has to happen to you. (sighs) The breath of God has to come into your life. And if you've not experienced the breath of God, you may be walking and your blood is pumping through your veins, but you're spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. That's that's not meant to be offensive. It's meant to, to get you to see that it's the truth about spiritual things. We're talking spiritual things. So he added the letter Ha to Abraham's name, but he also added the letter Ha to Sarai's name, calling her Sarah. Verse 15 of chapter 17, God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Sarai simply means my princess. While Sarah is a bit of a promotion, it means my queen, a noble princess. Still, he added the the ha, one single letter that would change everything for both of them. And this, of course, indicates that a miracle of new birth was required. God's Spirit would be required in order to do this wonderful work. In order for Sarah to become a mom, a miracle had to happen. It wasn't going to be an act of the flesh any longer. And oh, by the way, in modern Hebrew, the letter Ha is often used to represent the name of God, as Ha is a shortened Shortened, verb, uh, shortened word for Hashem, which means the name. Remember we talked about that last week. It's another way of saying God without actually saying the name of God. So it simply means the name. Well, Abraham believed God. And he fell down and worshipped God in verse 4 and verse 17 of chapter 17. This, again, being an act of genuine faith. And, and, and joyous acceptance of God's promise as if he said, yes, I believe it. I believe you, God, and I worship you. And if I may, this is what faith looks like as we celebrate it as if we've already received it, even though we don't have the evidence of it. We have God's Word, and that's enough for us. That's what faith looks like. And so in response to this faith that Abra- Abraham displays, God gave him more. He promised him more blessings and revealed even more information. Notice verse 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you. Kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God or Elohim to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land which you are a stranger in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God, their Elohim. And he promised him, again, many descendants and a country, a a homeland, in order to house them all. Right now, they were nomadic people, but God says, no, no, you're not going to be that way forever. I'm giving you a home. I'm giving you this land, and it's the land of Canaan, later would become known as the land of Israel. It's the promised land. This is, of course, the promised land known as Israel today. Notice something else, too, that this land was to be an everlasting possession. And that's why many Christians today, Bible-thinking Christians, recognize and support Israel's right to possess the promised land. We recognize it as such because God made it a decree. 
We don't believe that the Palestinians have a right to it or any claim to it. We believe it belongs to Israel by God's word, God's promise. It is an everlasting possession. However, realistically, we don't expect that the world community honors God's decrees at all. So we expect fireworks instead, which is what we get. Now in the next few verses of this chapter, God instituted the ritual of circumcision. And thankfully, it's only a Jewish ritual and not something that Gentiles have to worry about. What I mean is that it's not required for one's salvation. The New Testament deals with that, right? Then God said something amazing concerning Sarah. In verse 16, I will bless her, Sarah, and also give you a son by her, then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of peoples shall be from her. Wow, that's a miracle. I can imagine Abraham scratching his head. Next chapter, chapter 18, God appears to them in the form of the angel of the Lord and says the same thing, repeats the promise. And Sarah became, began to laugh. You're right. Are you kidding me? And there was the argument between her and the Lord, if you remember. But this was just too much for Abraham. And so he fell down and began to worship the Lord again. And that's probably right. Because the more information we are getting from the Lord, the more we want to worship him for what we know. But this was sheer amazement on Abraham's part, not disbelief. Abraham fell on his face, it tells us there in verse 17, and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And the idea here is, again, it's not disbelief. It's faith as he went, amazing. He's already believing it. And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Amazing. And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. We know that this was faith. We know that it was not disbelief at all. And that's because of what Paul said in Romans chapter 4 and verse 17. That is what the scriptures mean, Paul said, when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about a hundred years of age he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. Our faith brings glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as a righteous man. Because of faith. Here this man believed. He just simply believed. Against all odds, against every reason, every logical, scientific cause for reason or, or, or logic. He, it was all against him. Yet he believed. And even in that, he prayed for his son Ishmael. In verse 18, Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And here we see that Abraham was still trying to take control and steer the ship. That's a great promise. God, I love it and I believe you. I love it. But, you know, we've got Ishmael right here. We don't have to go through that whole miracle thing. We'll just use him. Abe, get your hand off the steering wheel. Stop trying to take control. We do that. It's our nature. We're control freaks. Let go. Let the Lord do the driving. Ishmael represents the flesh. Ishmael is the work of the old man, the old way, the old life, whereas Isaac represents the new man of faith and the, and the fruit that comes of walking in the Spirit of God. And so in verse 19, God answers Abraham's prayer. God said, no. Let Ishmael walk before you. No. Are we okay with a no answer from God? I don't like to hear the word. I don't like to hear no at all. Is it time for dinner? No. I get mad. I want to eat now. I want now. Now. I don't want to wait ever. I want it now. It's not because I'm impatient. 
It's because I'm impatient and a control freak. I want it now. God said no. Sometimes God says no because he has something better. God said, no, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son. Maybe you didn't understand the first time. I'll say it again. Your wife, Sarah, is going to give you a son, and we're going to call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. In other words, we're not going down that road again, Abraham. This time we're doing it my way. You did it your way, and we were in a mess. What I want you to do is sit in the back seat and just watch. Just watch the scenery and see how great this, this is going to happen. Verse 20, as, as for Ishmael, God you know, is not unreasonable, he's not unfair. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. And behold, I have blessed him too and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall be, get 12 princes, princes and I will make him a great nation. And so uh, he heard Abraham's prayer he recognized the love that he had for his son Ishmael. But Ishmael was not the son of promise. Isaac was. Abraham couldn't see what God saw. Abraham didn't get that. He couldn't possibly know the miraculous power of the all-sufficient El Shaddai. He'd only just met him in this way. And that's what Paul meant when he said he had to grow in this faith. This is a brand new revelation for him just coming into the understanding of this God, still growing, so much more to learn. All he had to do was relinquish the controls and let God do the driving. In closing relationship to this, there was a 1972 song by Chuck Gerard who wrote uh, these terrific lyrics uh, to his song front seat back seat and the chorus goes like this i was sitting in the front seat trying really hard to be the driver thinking i was making real good time but always winding up the late arriver but now i've been trying out the back seat and i find it is a very great relief now i'm riding in the back seat and i'm leaving all the driving to the chief isn't that great? It's a great relief. It's a great relief when all you have to do is sit back and enjoy the ride. In that same devotional that I've been reading by Billy Graham, he tells the story of a little girl whose father was an airline pilot. And uh, as they crossed over the Atlantic together, a storm came up, and there was no way that they were going to be able to avoid the effects of it. And so the pilot's daughter was in the back asleep in the, in the coach cabin. And so the flight attendant had to wake her up to fasten her seatbelt since uh, they were about to hit turbulence. And the little girl opened her eyes from her sleep and asked if her father was flying the plane. And the flight attendant confirmed that he was, in fact, flying the plane. And so the little girl just smiled and went back to sleep because she was relieved to know that her dad had the controls and was flying the plane, and that she had nothing at all to worry about. But listen, if El Shaddai is driving, you have nothing at all to worry about either. Let him drive. Oh, he'll let you drive if you want to. You just may not like what happens next. But he will let you drive. Listen, think about it. When you've driven your lives, haven't you made huge mistakes when you're in control isn't it a mess think about it or you may say well it's not that bad well maybe it's not but it could be better if El Shaddai is in control let him have control of your life it's best to give him control from the beginning he's El Shaddai he is all all sufficient he is enough he is all that you will ever need Jesus is El Shaddai Give your life to him and watch the scenery. Enjoy the ride. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'll help us all to understand this message and, and put our confidence in you, our trust in you, as we realize that you are more than capable of getting us home safely. 
And we know that's the desire that you have, and that is to bring us home, to bring us into that new home that we call heaven. And you have a place for us there. Between here and there, the road could be a bit turbulent, or the way could be turbulent. And we ask for your, your assistance, Lord. We don't want you to be the co-pilot. We want you to pilot the plane. We want you to get us there, get us there safely. If you're here right now and you've made a mess of your life, give it back to Him. Give, give your life in its current condition. Don't try and fix it before you give it back to Him. That's only going to make matters worse. Give Him your life right now. Let it go. He wants to bring peace into your heart. He wants you to become brand new. Let Him have your life. Talk to Him and say, Lord, here's my life. I've made a mess of it, it's true, and I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry I rejected you. I'm sorry that I wouldn't let you control my life, but it really is the best thing for me now. So here, here I am, standing before you and asking for your mercy. Please come into my heart. Fill me with your love. Save me, Lord. Forgive me. Fill me with your spirit. My life is now yours. I'm in your hands. Take me home safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.